Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. Today, my guest is Dr. Gladys Koemizukasoka, who is working at the intersection of animal and human health. Her work, primarily with the mountain gorillas of Uganda's windy, impenetrable national park, has contributed both to a resurgence in the gorilla population and to an improvement in the health and welfare of the human communities that live around the park. Conservation and public health mutually reinforcing each other. Win-win. Welcome, Dr. Gladys, and congratulations on your work. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. I want to talk today about gorillas, but let's start with the broader picture of zoonotic diseases. The U.S. CDC says that six out of 10 infectious diseases are zoonotic, everything from COVID and the other coronaviruses to rabies, to Lyme, West Nile, even to the plague. So maybe just a a starting question. What is a zoonotic disease and do pathogens go in both directions from animals to humans and humans to animals? Yes, um, zoonotic diseases, diseases that can spread between people and animals, although most people are familiar with diseases that spread from animals to people and those that tend to be called zoonosis and those that spread from people to animals tend to be called reverse zoonosis. And generally, all the diseases that you mentioned um, are diseases that can easily affect people and animals. And the coronavirus is a very good example of a disease that can jump from bats to other species to people, and then jump back from people to animals like great apes or even tigers, you know, at the zoo that got corona or mink, and then can easily jump back again to people. You mentioned the mink situation in Denmark, where the evidence seems to be that the pathogen went from humans to mink, mutated and went back to humans. And the extraordinary decision was made to cull the entire mink population, which seems to a non-scientist to be the worst of non-science. But leave that the specifics of Denmark aside, that process of a pathogen, if that's the right word, moving back and forth, how risky is it? Is there a risk that the virus mutates as it goes through that passage back and forth? Yes, there is a risk that the virus can mutate, but it can also just be as infectious when it hasn't mutated. And that was the problem with the Corona COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, basically jumped from bats to an intermediate host, which we don't know. And it's, all of this seemed to have happened in the Wuhan wet market, where live wild animals are taken from the wild and then brought into tiny little cages in a wet market that also has chickens and you know other domestic animals. And then because they're so stressed, because they're put in a stressful condition, it's easy for them to shed virus and then it jumps and eventually gets to people. And of course, because people live in a very dense environment, especially in urban areas, we have very huge density compared to wildlife, spread very, very quickly through people. And of course, with the mink situation, as you mentioned, actually earlier in the year, closer to the beginning of the pandemic, a few months after the pandemic began, half a million mink were culled because the coronavirus jumped from the mink handler to some of the mink. And I was quite shocked about that. But I guess now it's even higher, 15 million mink, as you say. I just feel that if we we have to treat animals properly in order to prevent such things happening. Uh, I mean, it's like the problem came from people. And of course, you know, there's a big panic. So kill as many mink as possible. But as long as we don't keep resolving this issue of going into wild habitats, catching animals and putting them in very bad animal welfare conditions, we're always going to have such pandemics. So, no, it's very sad that so many animals have to be sacrificed for the well-being of people. You said elsewhere, 
And I quote, in these fragile areas where wildlife, people, and livestock intersect, a decline in any of them affects the survival of the other. And as I thought about that, it's a really much broader concept of this we're all in it together uh, mantra that we've heard this year. How, how do you get these diseases under control in such a complicated transmission possibility? Um, yeah, it's it's quite daunting, but one thing that we're finding that works really well is um, a One Health approach where you address, you don't only address human disease by itself, but you address it together with addressing animal disease, um, whether that's livestock or wildlife and human disease together. And because they all live in an ecosystem or an environment, One Health is an approach where you you address human, animal, and ecosystem health together or environmental health together. And so whatever you're doing in one species, you try and do it in another. And also getting the doctors, the medical doctors, the veterinarians, and the environmentalists and conservationists to work together to solve a common problem is, is one very good way of doing it. I mean, for example, when there's the issue of the avian influenza, the bird flu, people were thinking of culling a whole lot of birds because they thought these birds are bringing bird flu to people and to poultry. And, but you're going to decimate, you know, rare species of wild birds. And it's not really going to solve the problem in the long run at all. But if you have the conservationists together with the domestic animal people and the human health people together, then they realize that there are better ways of handling such situations. And One Health is what you have worked in conservation through public health. It is it is what you do for a living. Does it work? I'd say that it does. <laughs> I mean, when we founded Conservation Through Public Health in 2003, it was primarily because of the experiences I had working as a first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, where I was really hired because gorilla tourism had begun and they were concerned that a fatal flu such as COVID-19 could jump into the gorillas and, and wipe them out. And that time there were only about 650 mountain gorillas left in the whole world. And so they felt that at least if we have a vet, they will be able to look out for this in time. But, and, and that was a great, a very good first step. And But one of the first diseases I had to deal with was not actually from the tourists, it was from the local community living around the park. Because once you get gorillas used to people, a process called habituation, they, have, they start ranging outside the park boundary. Because maybe they used to before, but because of human population growth cut, cutting right up to the edge, where there's a very hard edge around most of the forest, they had stopped going, but now that they've lost their fear, they come out. And they got it when they were eating people's banana plants and people put dirty clothing on scarecrows to scare away gorillas, baboons, any other wildlife. And we think that that's how they got scabies. So it wasn't one of those diseases that, you know, is one of the major diseases that's at tackled as a public health issue, but it really showed that these people had very poor hygiene and something needed to be done to help them. And so that led us to start conservation through public health. And so we started this NGO um, thinking that now let's see how we can improve the health of the people as well as the health of the wildlife. And in doing so at CTPH, we're actually seeing a lot of gain because by improving the health of the people, when gorillas come out, they don't find open defecation. Many people have got toilets now and they have hand washing stations or hand washing facilities. And these have, have actually increased even more during COVID-19 pandemic because people are worried about making each other sick. And so gorillas are falling sick less often. And so we're finding that by doing that, we're reducing the threats to gorillas, but also people feel happy that we're addressing healthcare, which is a basic human need. And very often conservationists are seen as people who care more about the animals and the forest the wildlife more than the people. But by bringing in a health intervention, we're showing the local communities that we also care about them and their welfare and well-being. We're not only concerned about the wildlife and the forest. And so that it's been a very good entry point to be able to get them to buy into conservation. So their attitudes to conservation are improving, you know, where we also talk about the fact that zoonotic diseases can occur. And if they jump from us to the gorillas, we can lose a valuable resource, which is bringing a lot of tourism revenue and which people really, I mean, the gorilla tourism has lifted many of those communities out of poverty. But then also 
by telling them, you know, don't poach, don't eat animals in the forest because you're destroying the habitat, you're destroying other species. You can also get sick from these animals in the forest. And we really need this forest even just to have it there for, as a water catchment so that there's enough water around and there's enough rain. So it's such an opportunity to talk about conservation issues when you're bringing healthcare to them. And so we work with those existing people and train them to also bring conservation messages to the community, teaching people to do things properly. So it's kind of, it's worked well. People's attitudes are changing because we're also addressing healthcare and as a, which is a basic human need. And a basic human right. We're a year. Actually, yes, yeah, a basic human right. <laughs> we are a year into this pandemic. Uh, it is, there's been a lot of progress. There's been a lot of, of, of misery. We are where we are. What has been the impact of the pandemic on the mountain gorillas, on you, on your communities? The a pandemic has had a great impact on the mountain gorillas, um, mainly bad, but a little bit of good. The greatest impact has been the fact that very few people are visiting because there have been lockdowns all over the world and people couldn't travel anyway. And most of the tourists who visit the mountain gorillas are international tourists who pay you know, as much as $600, it was before July, now 700 to spend an hour with the mountain gorillas. And a lot of that money goes to support the local authority, the, the World, Uganda Wildlife Authority that manages the gorillas and other wildlife in all the national parks. And also it goes also to support the communities. So all of this, the pandemic meant that this kind of, this income kind of ground to a halt. And the great thing about the ecotourism industry around Windy is that it was a very good example of ecotourism where everybody's involved in gorilla tourism. And even uh, we started a social enterprise called Gorilla Conservation Coffee, supporting farmers around the park. But most of our customers were the tourists who come to Windy because they want to support the farmers who they probably meet on their way up to the gorillas. So all of this disappeared and it resulted in people going back to the forest where they used to go before guerrilla tourism began. And poaching has really increased, not only in Bwindi, but all over Uganda and all over Africa. But in Bwindi, it was quite shocking how, you know, it's, it's increased to the level that one of the guerrillas actually got killed by a poacher. You said there's also some positive. There's a silver lining here somewhere, I hope. There is a silver lining. Um, one of the biggest threats we're concerned about the pandemic is disease. And, you know, COVID-19 is highly, highly contagious, as you know, as you've seen. And we were concerned anyway that tourists were getting too close to the gorillas um, long before the pandemic began. And when we did studies with students from University of Kent in Canterbury and Ohio University in the U.S., we found that 60% of the time, the tourists got closer than the viewing distance of seven meters. And 40% of the time, it's the gorillas who broke the rules because they're so used to people and they're so tolerant and accommodating. And so this was a big opportunity for disease to be spread. And with COVID where, you know, you just cough on someone and they can pick up the disease, we got very concerned. So during the pandemic, when it just started in Uganda in March, we got together with the Uganda Wildlife Authority who actually requested us to see how we can get people to wear masks and train the rangers to really enforce the viewing distance and hand hygiene. So we got together with other organizations, other conservation partners on the ground, and we did this. It was an opportunity to bring the conservation partners together, International Gorilla Conservation Program, Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, Max Planck Institute, and Bundy Community Hospital, which is an NGO missionary hospital in the area. And we talked about preventing COVID between ourselves and between ourselves and the gorillas. So that was an opportunity to upgrade the great ape viewing rules where wearing masks has now become mandatory, not only for the gorillas, but the chimpanzees. And also it's, it's the viewing distance has increased and it's really enforced and strict hand hygiene and temperature taking before you go in. So it made it uh, safer now for the gorillas, not only for COVID-19, but any other respiratory disease that may come around. So I think that's the silver lining that the great ape viewing guidelines were increased. 
um, and improved. But another silver lining is, for some reason, we've had a baby boom. We've had more gorillas being born <laughs> in this space of time than they, it has been in the past. And we still don't know why, but there are all these gorillas that have been born have been, were conceived before the pandemic began. And... It's just nice that, you know, we're having many gorillas being born. We've had, like, for example, eight gorillas being born in the space of two months, which doesn't normally happen all the time. And uh, doesn't, it rarely happens, so we're really pleased. There's been a baby boom in Uganda, Rwanda, and DRC. So, and apparently there's been a baby boom for all wildlife species. You know, once you leave them alone, the fact that there's been little tourism means that they've been able to get on and, you know, maybe carry their babies to full term. I don't know, there's been less human disruption and maybe the wildlife has been able to thrive better in some ways. That's absolutely fascinating. Have you gotten to, you've had the privilege of working with the mountain gorillas for years now. Have you made friends? Yes, I've made friends with many gorillas. I have. Um, I've made a number of friends with the gorillas. My my favorite gorilla, one of my favorite gorillas, unfortunately died like two years ago, three years ago. But what I really liked about him is I knew him since he was a little baby. And I operated on his older sister when she had a rectal prolapse, which was a very strange condition to have. But she recovered from that. They called her Kahara because she loved babysitting her little brother. And after we operated on her, when the, the rectum came out of her body, she eventually left the group because she was a female and she couldn't stay in the group where her father was the only silverback that mates with all the females. And so she moved out. But Kanyonyi grew up seeing people all his life. So when he became a big silverback heading the group after his father died, Ruhendeza, um, who was the first group, it was the first group to be habituated for tourism. And he was a very friendly gorilla. Then he, he just got too old to keep up with the group and died. And then, so when Kanyonyi took over, he used to frighten tourists and see their reaction because he's been seeing them since he was a baby. Um, yeah, so he was one of my favorite gorillas. And actually, we ended up naming him um, after the... We, we named our first coffee blend, coffee brand after him, Kanyonyi Coffee Brand, that we started in with Gorilla Conservation Coffee in Bwindi, where we help Arabica coffee farmers. But unfortunately, he fell off a tree never recovered from that injury and then fought with another silverback that wanted to take over his group. And he just never recovered in spite of treatment. And so unfortunately we lost Kanyonyi in that way. But uh, I remember when I wrote a tribute about him on Facebook, we got like 300 shares because so many people remembered him and they showed their photos with Kanyonyi. So he was like a, a gorilla that symbolized the great efforts, conservation efforts that have resulted in a big change in community attitudes. And, you know, they're very, very supportive of the conservation efforts on the ground. Because what was really amazing is uh, when Kanyonyi's elder, Kanyonyi's father settled in community land, the Wildlife Authority called me and said, could you maybe translocate him back? Because he's not keeping with the group. But when we got there, we saw that he really wanted to settle in community land, um, which is just bordering the park. And he was only occasionally taking a banana a banana plant or coffee. So we just said to everybody, can you tolerate that? And they said, we can. When our elders get, get old, we look after them. And so can, Ruhendeza stayed there for a few months. And then when he died, the communities came to pay their last respects at his grave. So it just showed that, you know, they understood that this is a gorilla that allowed tourism to begin because he was heading that group. And it, because of him, gorilla tourism began. So they're seeing that their future is so tied into the future of the gorillas. And I think when you get to that level of coexistence, then there's a big future for the wildlife. And, um, and the COVID-19 pandemic almost disrupted this, but we've been talking to them often and telling them that in spite of tourists not coming, and now there are a few of them are beginning to come, you know, we have to keep protecting the gorillas because they've lifted them out of poverty. And, you know, we have to just protect them, even if they're not bringing in money all the time. A perhaps silly question. How do you think the gorillas are feeling now, a year into this change in their life, change in, in their environment? Do you think they're aware of the changes? Obviously, they're having more babies, so there, there's some good things here. Uh, but it's a serious question. How do you think the gorillas are thinking about this? Um, I'd say that the gorillas are used to, were used to getting visitors coming to see them every day. 
different visitors every day for one hour each day and they were just seeing a lot of traffic in their habitat and now the only traffic they get is the park rangers who have to check on them every day to make sure they're healthy and protected and they stay with them for like an hour and then but they stay nearby not far from them just to make sure they're protected and like a few days ago we were down there visiting the gorillas and you could see that they they're actually quite happy to see the visitors coming back, you know. <laughs> Some of them even try and get close to you because they think, hey, you're back. But then we move back because we have to maintain the 10 meter distance. What's next for conservation through public health? What is the future? What would you like to accomplish having gotten to this point? Where do you go now? <laughs> um, for conservation through public health, we'd love to scale our or replicate to scale our One Health approach to conservation, and in so many different ways. Um, one of them is through tourism, and we joined the Africa CSO Alliance for, by, by, for the Convention of Biological Diversity. It actually just started because of the pandemic. You know, we're supposed to have a big conference, which never happened because of the pandemic, and we're like, why don't we get together as the African organizations working in this in this space and strengthen the African voice within the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so they were all happy with the work that we're doing in upgrading the gorilla viewing rules. And we were like, why don't we write a policy brief for all the countries where great apes are found? Because gorilla tourism is doing so well in Uganda and Rwanda, it's actually contributing significantly to the GDP and getting people out of poverty. And the governments recognize that these species are very, very important and they want to protect them partly because of the huge revenue coming in. And there's a possibility for that to happen in all the other countries in Africa where great apes are found. And actually, currently, there's tourism happening in 13 out of 21 countries in Africa with great apes. But all of the other places, it's not happening at the high level of Uganda and Rwanda. And it could, but if it does, it needs to be done carefully to prevent zoonotic diseases happening uh, or wiping them out. So that's an opportunity. That's something that we're scaling up to all these different countries, great ape, responsible great ape tourism. But we also want to work in um, other countries where gorillas are found to scale up the work we're doing with the local communities. So the more that we can scale up our approach that combines human health, gorilla health, and livelihood improvement, we feel that it would be great to scale it all over Africa. But we're also working in other parts of Uganda with other species, with other organizations who are looking at disease issues between, you know, wildlife, livestock, and people, and, you know, in savanna habitats and mountain habitats and forest habitats. And we also helped to shape a... Um, an East African community population health environment strategy, which is combining family planning, health, and environment around these protected areas. Unfortunately, most of the protected areas in Africa have very high human population growth rates. And as long as you have such a huge population growth rate, it's very hard to have wild places because people always see the national park land or the protected area land as free. So yeah, for sure, we'd love this approach to be you know, scaled up in other places and work with all the other organizations to show them how we're doing what we're doing. But I have to say that conservation is a very dying, is, is a field that is affected by so many different factors. And a multidisciplinary approach is the only way that we'll be able to save the wild species and the wild habitats for future generations. I'm talking to you from Connecticut, where we have a big issue between a growing population of black bear yes. and, and people. And I, as you're talking, I'm thinking that this isn't an Afri just an African issue or just an Indian issue. It's an issue in the United States, it, it, everywhere that we're having this intersection between growing human populations, growing animal populations. We need to think about it differently which is precisely, Dr. Gladys, what you're doing. You're thinking about it differently. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, we are trying to see the best way to address it. And yep, sometimes it's a bit disruptive, but because um, <laughs> when we started CTPH, people were like, why are you combining conservation and public health? Why are you combining animal health and human health? And yeah, there's a lot of advocacy there, but we're glad to see that we're seeing benefits. It's big, we're seeing win-win situation for both people, animals, and the environment. Well, thank you for this conversation. 
far more importantly, thank you for the work that you're doing because it clearly is incredibly valuable where you're doing it, but beyond. <laughs> Not just in the parts of Africa where you're working, throughout the continent, and I would think beyond the continent. There, there's lessons here for all of us. Uh, again, thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org, and please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.